Hi guys, how are you? Mine this one titanium. Welcome back to Real Macro Economics and Investing. Patreon.com slash Real Macro. All right, so let's do a video. This is not necessarily uh, for building an economy from scratch. Um, we're just going to go back because I got a comment. They're like, oh, you're starting to sound more like an Austrian. How do I sound more like an Austrian? The last thing I sound like is an Austrian. Um, so what was I saying back in 2017? Okay, and I love saving the tape. Save the tape, right? Save the tape. July 2017, right down here. Okay, I was saying the same thing. Nothing changes. I have changed nothing from what I am saying. Uh, rest in peace, the graveyard of savings for all dollars. All right, and in this video, I'm explaining QE. And uh, before we continue in talking about QE, let me show you something. Here is a chart of the S&P 500. And we had a dot-com bubble that uh, exploded in 2000. The market for the next couple of years went all the way down 50%. What was the deficit then? 1.5% of GDP, right? And then we had a recovery. Not only in the economy, but also uh, in the stock market. And then we had the great financial crisis, and we went to 10% deficits. That's an interbank problem. It wasn't a, uh, a vast economic problem, right? It was an interbank. You can't have a society run without banks. Sorry. <laughs> it's not the way it works. So you want a backstop risk for the banking system to get it going again? That's fine. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Okay? It's not necessarily affecting the real economy uh, when you have an interbank problem and you're fixing it. It's actually saving the economy, not, not, uh, uh, not causing harm to it. And for that reason, I didn't have much of a problem what goes on interbank. However, I do have a problem when you are increasing deficits to 20% and it's becoming the new norm. You can't print, borrow, and import to infinity. All right? That's my belief. You, whether you like it or not, I don't care. <laughs> okay? That you cannot keep printing to infinity. So when Jay Powell comes out and he says, we have many tools. We are not out of ammo. We have many, you have many tools? Really? <laughs> How... Deficits is tools? No, it's one thing. You just print. <laughs> That's it. That's not tools. All right. Lending is not a tool. It's deficits. That's your only tool. And that tool has been used exhaustively to this point. So let's go back in time. And this is another chart that uh, I like. And it has all the QEs when they started and so forth. Not only here, but also the ECB. And I've left out the Bank of Japan and China and whatever. But again, what do you see here? Right? Did the market go up because the economy was so good? Or did the market go up as much as it did? I'm not saying it shouldn't. Because of all the QE. Right? You got to, you got to, you know, ask yourself these questions and not just take what people say at face value. Go back and look at it. Why, why did we recover here? Because deficits, deficits have nothing to do with it. 1.5% is a joke, right? Again, we, we run into this extremism. We go from the Austrians that gold is real money, that we should go to sound money, that we should reduce the amount of money in existence to create value for the currency and screw the economy. And then we go to the other side of the spectrum, where we're sitting here now saying, oh, you know, let's print money and let's QE everything and let's do repos and increase deficits. And yeah, this is the, the path to prosperity because we're doing it for the people. That, I mean, how do you go from one extreme to the other? And this is the way people think, unfortunately. It's this mentality that you're with us or against us. It's a political thing, you know, and politics are so, people love them. Why? Because they can say whatever the fuck they want. It doesn't matter. You know, they don't have to prove anything. 
See, it's not the same thing in economics and and, and trading and investing. It's not the same thing. You you gotta you gotta take that information. You gotta translate it. You need to figure out what's actually really going on. Is this move up real or is this bullshit? Well, the market is always right. Well, yeah, the market is always right when you're in a trade because you're losing your ass or you're making your uh, money out of your ass. Okay, yeah, in that sense, sure. But in the sense of is the market doing what it's supposed to and the market is always right, no, that's not true. If the market was always right, then it would never, ever, uh, uh, no one would ever be able to make money. I've been posting this chart forever and a day, right? And I said euphoria, anxiety, denial, fear, panic, capitulation, anger, depression, disbelief, right? This is the downgrade, which was ridiculous. Anyway, uh, uh, hope, optimism, thrill. Here's Grexit, China, hard landing, Trump, all these headlines, right? Euphoria was the last one. I didn't put euphoria there after it happened. I put euphoria before it happened, all right? That's the last last phase. What happened? Market collapsed. Then what happened? Well, we came in with an endless MMT. If you go back to the other chart, where is it at? Right? Where, if, if you can see here, where did I say MMT everything? When the market was at, uh, on, and this is the, the uh, SPY, when, when the, uh, the market was at 290, where is it at today? 330. We went as high as 360. It's not something that <laughs> uh, you, you don't recognize, you don't see when you understand the macroeconomics from a real perspective. Should the market be at all-time highs with the economy collapse back to 2014-15 levels? I mean, are you serious or what? Then people come with one-liners. I, I, I love these one-liners. They don't even understand what they mean. Well, you know, the market could be rational longer than, you know, uh, uh, than you can remain solvent. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> but it doesn't mean the market is right. Uh, you understand? I was bitching about COVID from January. From January, I was bitching about COVID. I said, this is going to be a problem, right? It's airborne. Airborne turned to pandemics. And then what happened? Well, was, was the market right back here when I was bitching about it? No. Did I not say it was euphoric? Yes, right? That's what I kept saying, wherever that chart is. Let me find it. Where is it? There you go. Euphoric. It's euphoria. Right? Well, Nick, you were lucky. You were lucky because of COVID. No, I wasn't lucky because of COVID. The data has come in. Uh, we went into, we were going into recession, right? That The data back in February, which COVID was not, not an issue in the U.S., we were going into a recession anyway. I went bearish in September, October, okay? The euphoria, everything that I've said coincides with exactly what happened. Now, the fact that the market went straight up is a different story, okay? That only proves what I've been saying on my YouTube channel for years. The deficits end up in savings, and those savings end up in asset prices, and that's why I was against the Bernie Sanders. They thought they were going to get this free lunch. We're going to spend four or five trillion dollars and we're all going to be rich. Right? Green New Deal, government jobs, you know, whatever. Free money. What is Trump doing? The same thing. Worse. He's doing even worse. He's the biggest socialist there is on the planet. And I don't want to get political here. I don't like Trump. Period. The guy's a liar. But forget about that. <laughs> it still comes back down to the same thing. That you printed four or five trillion dollars and you got no economic growth out of it. When you're sitting here telling me, oh, well, there's a recovery. Recovery? No, we just ended the lockdown. So, of course, you're going to see some of the numbers improve. But you're recovering from 2014. You're not recovering from January 2020. That's not a recovery. So why are stocks at all-time highs? This is self-evident. You don't need me. I have nothing to do with you. I just told you what was going to happen. And that's exactly what happened. So don't tell me that I sound like an Austrian. How do I sound like an Austrian? Am I against stimulus for the people? No. I think they should do more of it. Right? That's the whole point of deficits. To support the productive economy. That's the point of deficits. 
when you are in a recession. You help the economy. You don't fix the economy. There's a difference be, between the two concepts. And you got to understand them. You can't, you cannot say that, well, the economy recovered because of stimulus. Well, no, it didn't, because the economy recovered here with no stimulus. The economy does what the economy does, okay? It's a fallacy for people to believe that it was government stimulus. It's not stimulus. It doesn't stimulate anything. You know what stimulus is? Do you know what it means? I'll tell you what it means. You put a dollar of newly created dollars, right? You print a dollar out of thin air, you get two dollars of GDP. That's stimulus. You're stimulating. You're getting more than one for what you're doing. That's a stimulus, okay? When you're getting less than one, when you're getting less than one, that's not stimulus. That's just wasted dollars. You're devaluing the currency. Let's go back to the video of 2017. And I'll play it for you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about QE so we all understand what it means. Central, forget about the Fed here, okay? It's a central bank. So the central bank creates money out of thin air, goes into the open market, buys bonds, liquefies savings, okay, into dollars, the, um, because the central bank exchanges dollars for bonds, takes those bonds, puts them on the balance sheet, and then the interest payments go uh, to um, the central bank, okay? Now, a lot of people say that, you know, well, you know, this is removing income from circulation, it's on printing and so on. That is true to the extent that trickle-down economics works. Uh, if trickle-down economics uh, was a great success, then uh, the savings would funnel back into the functional economy uh, and, and grow the economy. We know that doesn't work. Okay. So does some of this money, uh, interest income, go into circulation? Of course it does. But the vast majority of hedge funds and pension funds, uh, all they do is go out and buy uh, more bonds or uh, other assets okay, because they have liquefied those dollars. So when they re, um, when they take, okay, oh, <laughs> what, what, what do I sound like an Austrian like? That's just nonsense. You're not following me. You're not listening to what I'm telling you. You're just randomly saying things for the sake of saying them. That's not constructive. I like constructive criticism. I like being forced to think, but you're coming out with nonsense and you're saying the stupid things. There's nothing that I've changed about what I'm saying. Nothing. And believe me, there's a lot of things that I've changed. Of course there are. That's development. But the core is the same. Let's go back in time and let's talk about the housing problem. The housing, the housing. It's due to Greenspan lower interest rates. He's the one that did it. Oh, you know, it's, it's, it's Greenspan. It's lower interest rates. It's cheap money. Low interest rates? <laughs> Do you know where interest rates are today? They're far, far lower. What happened to home prices? They flattened out since 2012. Or, I'm sorry, uh, 2016. They haven't gone anywhere. But they're much higher than they were in 2000. Interest rates are much lower. So how does that argument, you know, pan out? How, how does that work out? You're still sitting here believing it was a housing because of Greenspan's low interest rate bubble? Again, this is why I, I call what I, my, what I do real macro, because I care about the re reality of things, okay? It's 10 years later. I can sit here and point to you that that was bullshit line, that, oh, you know, it's uh, Greenspan. It's low interest rates. No. <laughs> interest rates weren't even lower. We don't have a housing bubble, okay? We have an everything bubble. Go listen to Colin Roach. Go listen to all the experts. The monetary experts, they were like, well, the market is not going up because of liquidity. You know, there's an improvement. Improvement? What? <laughs> the market is a forward-looking indicator. What? What are you talking about? What happened? QE flattened out at $7 trillion. What happened? What's happening to the market now? Hmm? Where is the market now? It's going nowhere. Right? Uh, let's shrink it down a little bit. What happened? I'll uh, take all this stuff off. You guys don't know what that means. All right? What happened? Flanned out. Done. Coming back down. Why? <laughs> okay. Let's take a look at personal consumption. Okay? The last figure was, uh, what, July? I don't even know what the latest one is. Clearly, clearly, 
if you go back all the way to the 50s, okay, we've never had anything close to this collapse in uh, PC. Uh, and PC, just so you understand, personal consumption is 70% of GDP, okay? How are you going to have improved earnings per share? How are you going to have more corporate profits? How are you going to do all these things when consumption has shrunk? Hmm? How, how does that work? Well, you know, the price of the market doesn't matter to the fundamentals. Sure, it doesn't matter uh, for a period of time. But ultimately, you are buying something of value, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't buy it. This is not Bitcoin, <laughs> okay? It's not casino. Eventually, reality does hit, okay? You need to understand what affects it, what affects market prices, Where's the inflation? Monetary inflation is always uh, inflation is always an everywhere monetary phenomenon. Yes, it is. The fact that you can't see it on CPI doesn't matter. It still exists. The water that you've poured into the glass still exists. It's somewhere. And where is that? That's in asset prices. Let's go back to 2019. The fiscal year for, just so you know, the government checkbook ends September, end of September 30th. Okay, um, let's go back. Deficits for 2019 were $22 trillion. Okay, $22 trillion. And the tax revenues was $2.9 trillion. trillion. All right. Let's go to today. And we're almost towards the end of September. Okay, it's 17th. All right, what is the deficit as of today? 26.7 trillion dollars all right we've added about four trillion dollars and remember we started printing excessively right in late march early april so imagine what it's going to be uh for the one year rolling 12 months uh rolling 12 months uh, what is going to be the deficit what are tax revenues two 2.8 right another couple weeks to go we're going to go back to 2.9 again. Really? <laughs> if you're going to sit here and print $4 trillion and tax a portion of it back and say, look, tax revenues are fine. <laughs> it's like paying yourself like numbers on a spreadsheet and saying, look, everything is great. Right? That's what MMTers do. They, they just look at numbers in a spreadsheet. They, they don't apply value to it. And they say, look, everything equals to zero. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Well, we're deficits in uh, 2019, right? We ended up the year with 4.6% uh, to, uh, to GDP of GDP uh, in deficits. What is it going to be this year, right? And we're not talking about the end of the fiscal year where it's, you know, it's going to be like 16%. I'm talking about a year from when we started to print. It's going to be more than 20, right? Where is all the savings? Where is all the economic growth? Where is everything? Where is the stimulus? <laughs> it's a disaster, right? Consumption is way down. I've shown this chart before. Okay, this is 2016. It's an old one. It doesn't matter. The same, the same thing still applies. Consumption is 68%, of, almost 70% of GDP, right? That's what it is. If we go back to the high, okay, which was uh, 14.8, let's say $15 trillion, and the debt uh, was, what, 22%? Uh, I'm sorry, $22 uh, trillion? But let's do the math, okay? Let's say $15 trillion divided by 22. 68% is consumption of GDP, okay, of debt. Let's go back and do the GDP now. The, the max that GDP went in Q4 2019 was, uh, I just had it, I'm getting old, uh, 19.3 trillion, let's say. And where's my calculator? All right, so uh, we said uh, about 15, okay? 15 divided by 19.3, okay? 77% of GDP was consumption in 2019 let's do the same math now and we'll see in today's number today gdp is 17.3 right so let's do the, the mathematics again it's 15 divided by 17.3 okay 86 percent 
now you're going to tell me that we are consuming more in a, in a pandemic with the economy shut down? <laughs> that, that doesn't make sense, does it? Right? Now let's do the mathematics with uh, with the with the debt, consumption to debt, right? It used to be 68, if you remember. Go back and watch the video again, All right? So we have uh, 15 divided by 26.8. Let's put it 26.8, 55. It went from 68 all the way down to 55. So who's funding it? Consumption to debt is falling. Okay. Consumption to debt is falling, and you're going to tell me that corporate earnings are going to rise and everything's going to be great, and stocks are forward looking, and the stock market is always right. But I sound like an Austrian. Come on now, come on now. Here's later on this video again. This is the one I posted back in 2017. Again, I'm talking about the earnings yield, the 10 year rate, uh, the case, uh, the Schiller PE ratio and the S&P dividend yield, okay? Now, when you look at these numbers, have they changed since then? And the answer is not much. The only thing that has happened is that the 10-year has gone from 2.27, and I, I know it's probably hard for you to see it, but it says here 2.27, okay? And it's gone all the way down to 0 0.7, 0 0.7. Here. It's, it's, this is the same chart, but it's today's numbers, okay? It's exactly where it was back in 2017, okay, the PE. How about the dividend yield? Exactly the same place. How about the earnings yield? Exactly the same place. How about the 10-year? Well, that's down to 0.7. Oops, hate when it does that. That's down to 0.7. Well, what drove the 10-year down to 0.7? And here, here it is, okay? This is just the treasuries on the Fed's balance sheet, okay? We went from 2.1 all the way up to 2.4. Or, I'm sorry, 4.4 just about, okay? You want to unleash these bonds back into the market, see where interest rates go? And you're telling me that, oh, you know, it's not liquidity driving uh, asset prices. Really? Okay, reverse QE. Unleash all those bonds into the open market. Tell me where <clears throat> interest rates are going to be then. See, all these people that never saw COVID coming from a mile away, and after the fact, they reacted, and then they, they see the stock market go up, they go back to the same you know, song and dance they've been playing for the last 10 years, right? So long as the market is going up, look how smart I am, right? Now, they're telling you the same thing. Oh, look, the market's going up. Yeah, let's go. The same song and dance. Look how smart I am. <laughs> right? Oh, no, no, it has nothing to do with liquidity. Stop saying that the Fed, oh, that's so stupid. Oh, you're dumb. Da -da 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 the same fucking thing. All right, big guy. Reverse QE. <laughs> Reverse it. Unleash $4.3 trillion of bonds into the open market in the same way you purchased them. Please, by all means, do it. See where interest rates go. See where interest rates go. So here's the way to read this, okay? You have a choice to either buy a bond or to buy stocks, okay? Now, the stocks are after taxes, and the earnings yield is before taxes, okay? Because you make money, you sell it, you're going to pay taxes on it. All right, so what would you rather prefer? Would you rather uh, own stocks that are riskier at 3.5%? Or would you rather have a 10-year bond that's going to give you 0.7 before taxes, right? And that's the fuckery. That's right there is the essence. You're always going to, you're forced into stocks. You're forced to go out and buy the stock market because money chases yield. Now, here's a question to you. Will the yield remain at 35 Okay, with consumption, 70% of GDP falling back to 2014 levels, 15. So of course, it's going to recover as the economy opens up and so forth. But that has nothing to do with QE. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, with stimulus. It's got nothing to do with it. Economies recover when economies recover. See, they put the cart ahead of the horse. The, the economy recovers on its own. And they say, oh, look, great. Look, you know, it's because of stimulus. 
Uh, no, no, no. And that's why we come back to this chart. That's why we come back to this chart because in 2002 deficits to GDP were 1.5 and the, com the economy did recover. Okay. 2020, you have 20% of uh, deficits. Okay. And the only thing that recovered is the stock market, not the economy. The economy is still way below where it was January 2020. 2017. Uh, 20. <laughs> uh, yeah, 2017. Right? What happened? Tax cuts. Oh, wonderful. We're going to have tax cuts. Yeah, this is great. It's going to be like jet fuel to the economy. Was it like jet fuel to the economy? Nope. It was jet fuel for, for, for stocks. The stock market took off, right? I thought all those trillions of uh, tax cuts were supposed to grow the economy. How are you going to grow the economy when you're already at 3.4% unemployment? <laughs> How does that work? What are you going to do? You're going to force people, babies to start working or something or, or what? You're suddenly going to become more innovative and efficient because you gave tax cuts? No. So what were deficits in 2019? Q4? At 4.6. Where is that all that economic growth? <laughs> right. What happened? Now we're going to be 16% by the end of the, this month, the end of the fiscal year. And then it's going to be 20 plus. Where's all the economic growth? Like jet fuel. Right? Is that what Trump was saying? Like jet fuel to the economy. I fly jets. I know what jet, jet fuel is. Trump doesn't. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the, a, again, you know, uh, there's nothing Austrian about what I'm saying. This is real macroeconomics and investing. I can point to things and show you why things that people say are wrong. It's not stimulus. All right, go to the to the uh, Fe Federal Reserve's COVID-19. Right, go and look from March on. Okay. Stimulus this, uh, lending facility that, more stimulus, uh, lowering interest rates, blah, blah, blah. Go, go and look at it. Go and look at it. Just go through it. All right? This is every event that happened. What happened since September 1st? You see any stimulus or any uh, new announcements? No. What's the market doing? Falling. That's Austrian. <laughs> it's not liquidity driving the markets higher. Here's TSA numbers relative to last year. Are we anywhere near where we were in terms of flying, in terms of a normal economy? Not even close. Okay? And airlines are very highly economically sensitive. They're very capital intensive. Uh, it's a capital intensive industry. Okay? Uh, yeah, well, there's just one section, you know, but the other sections are doing fine. Yeah, well. <laughs> That sounds great. That sounds good because there's always a part of the economy that's not firing on all cylinders. Okay, but not to this extreme. If you want to get back to January 2020 levels, okay, and that's the benchmark. Like it or not, that's the benchmark. If you want those levels and uh, you want those corporate profits to keep growing and, and doing what they're supposed to do to justify the prices in stocks, okay, then you need all uh, sectors to be firing on all cylinders. The fact that one industry is lagging a little bit, the other one under good circumstances, you know, that that's just CNBC talk. But when you're talking about large components of the economy, of the retail sector that are affected, this is not CNBC talk. This is reality. You can't grow an economy with a large portion of the economy uh, is suffering. So if there's anything you're going to take away from this video, is I want you to remember, deficits do not grow the economy. Deficits grow the stock market. Okay? You don't need, you don't need to take my word for it. It's in front of you. You can see it. All right? The deficits grow the stock market. It grows inequality. I'm not saying you can't use deficits in a proper manner. Yes, you can, and you should, and we must.
but you will not get more than one GDP for every new dollar that is created. That's stimulus. Pumping money into the stock market is not stimulus. You like uh, you like sound bites. You like little memes. You like little things to say. Um, the market is a forward-looking indicator. Buy the dip. Blah blah blah. You you will buy when there's blood in the street. But you like these things? Okay. Here's one. Price is what you pay. Value is what you get. You're not getting a whole hell of a lot of value at all-time highs. All right. Remember that. There's a time to buy, and there's a time not to buy, and there's a time to short. All right. They're not all the same. All right, that's it for this video. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Take care. Bye-bye.